This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast from Advanta IRA, where we show you how to explore investments beyond Wall Street and open your eyes to new options for your portfolio. It's time to take control and give yourself the freedom to choose where you invest your money. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. As always, my name is Alex Perney, and today we are pleased to welcome on Tyson Ray, one of the founders of Forum Wealth Advisors. We're going to be taking a look at some alternative ways of exploring financial planning for those of you out there, which is certainly right up the alley of what we like to talk about on investing and also we need to know how to plan for your financial futures. So Tyson, thank you very much for being on with us today. If you wouldn't mind, give us a little bit of background about yourself before we dive into the topic at hand. Yeah, I guess the uh, the short version of the long story is uh, I got into investing in part because I experienced what uh, what an eviction notice was on a fridge when I was like twelve. Started working uh, in the in the Midwest in an area where you kind of had a lot of money, and then you had a lot of people that didn't have a lot of money, and a lot of people that didn't have money were serving the people that did. And uh, one day I was getting a ride home from <clears throat> from the job I had. I lied at the house. I lived in as I was being dropped off because I was being dropped off by someone who was giving me a ride in their Ferrari. And I happened to ask the guy before I got out of the car, uh, you know, what'd you do? Like, what, what, like, how'd you get here? And he's, you know, he's like, well, I had a business, but he said, I, I really did well in, in the stock market. That was probably like 85, right? The movie wall street was in there somewhere in the early eighties. And, uh, yeah, so at, at age uh, at, at sixteen in high school, they played the stock market game where they basically gave you fake money, and this was back when you literally had like the Wall Street Journal or the paper to go find what the stocks did from the day before, right? There was no computer to go look them up, uh, and you 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 know built your portfolio, and within a few months, whoever made the most money won. Uh, I didn't, I didn't win that cause I didn't realize how much leverage, you know, they teach all the wrong fundamentals in that game. Cause it's who can make the most money qu- the quickest and leverage and so on and so forth. But coming out of that, I wanted to buy, uh, uh, an individual stock that I had tracked in the paper that had gone from 12 to seven. And I thought, Hey, at $7, like I have enough money from my, my bus boy tips that I can buy, you know, a hundred shares of this thing. And let's see what happens. This is exciting. And of course the problem was I was 16. I had to get my mom. Uh, as approval, who, of course, with an eviction notice and no money is like, you're not playing in the stock market like we can't afford to do that, blah, blah, blah. And uh, uh, I ended up dragging her into the advisor's office at the time. And and with some coaxing, my mom allowed me, which is funny because it was my money, which I was so upset about, uh, to start investing $100 a month into two different mutual funds. And it's kind of funny, like if mom would have said, yes, who knows where my career path would have been. It's like, it's often the things we were told we can't do that. We were like, well, if you can't do it, then you want to do it. Right. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, so I came out of, uh, came out of high school and was able at 18 to start making some decisions. And I, you know, bought a few stocks and leveraged my portfolio and then proceeded to blow it up. But when I graduated college, I had spent so much time trying to convince my mom why this made sense. It was a logical transition for me to go into the business of trying to help people understand why they should invest and the difference it can make. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just compounded from there. Um, uh, uh, the, over the last 25 years of doing this as a profession, I have had the privilege of apprenticing uh, in the first five years of my career underneath a gentleman who was a classic stockbroker, uh, which was really the era that he grew up in, and then watched how that kind of changed after 2000 in the tech bubble. And and it wasn't just picking stocks necessarily as much as it was building portfolios and things. He retired at 72. I was 27, I think it was. And when I took his practice over, I proceeded to retire about uh, six other financial advisor practices over my last 25 years. I've had the opportunity to work hire or work with as a manager of probably about another 20 financial advisors. So I've basically bought practices and seen how it's been done. I've tried to teach how it's been done. I've seen how others have done, have done this. And the book that I wrote called total relationship was about how I think it's best done. It's kind of like collecting of everything I've seen. I think there's a better way to do it than I think most people are going about it. And uh, that's what we get to talk about a little bit today. Absolutely. It's funny they bring up the stock market game. Uh, I had to do that in uh, my intro to, um, what was it? 
intro to business administration in my freshman year in college. And uh, freshman year in college, I say I wasn't the most studious of students. It was more concerned with, you know, when can we go to the beach and get some beer? And uh, yes, but ironically enough, it was spring of 2007. And we just my two partners in the group decided that, oh, we just want to get out of here. So we just basically put all of our allocation into Apple. And uh, what happened? But the iPhone released in spring of 2007. So uh, we inadvertently won in our class, which was no, like, it was just a fluke chance. But we thought we were the smartest kids that uh, you know, really existed. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty funny. It was, uh, yeah. and everyone was so angry in that class. They were like, these three guys that literally come for the test. <laughs> and we're like, right. hey. Yeah, we, we, crushed, we thought we were buying fruit. We, we, we didn't know, right? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, that was that was pretty funny. There's still some people that bring it up when we get together, but hey, you know, it is right. what it is. Right. So, to the topic of financial planning and you know, kind of the trajectory you've had, you know, what I really like to get the baseline of is, you know, if you you know obviously have kind of a different way of looking at things. But let's kind of start with the, you know, aspects of, you know, general financial planning and investing that you really think, you know, needed to be needed to be changed. Obviously, you have a different direction you like to go with it. But in the context of, you know, what you've seen that you feel like is either broken with the current system and how it works or just, you know, really doesn't play to the, you know, client's best interest. So let's kind of start with the issues that you've kind of seen around this industry and kind of get into, you know, what your opinions are and thoughts on, you know, how to improve that in the way that you do it as well. Yeah, I think. Um, so when I started in this career 25 years ago, our the title on my business card was still actually stockbroker. And it was back in 1998, 99, people, you still, you still had to call in to see what the stock market was doing, right? The screen was green. You'd go type in a symbol and get the quote. Um, and you're, you were taught to sell. I mean, I went to sales training to teach, to sell and give people a reason to buy. It's like the, the great movie with, with uh, a pursuit of happiness. You know, he was selling one thing and then he found out he could sell stocks and the rest was history. And, and uh, I think what has evolved over the last 25 years of my career is you're still, you, you've, what's evolved is the title. What the job is, is people are still selling last week's winning lotto numbers. I mean, they're still using past performance to say, this is why you should own something. And it's how much money do you have so I can put it in these products and either earn a commission or earn a, or a fee or a trail. And, and, and some type of financial planning may be on the front end to mask what the sale ends up being. But the whole idea of, um, of then spending all of your time with the client trying to show them a past performance report that has all these charts and graphs and they've created so many benchmarks you can go in a report and try and find something you beat to show the client you're adding some kind of value, but it's all backwards looking. And what the Total Relationship book is about is about trying to teach a different conversation about what I think and feel and have experienced what clients are really looking for, what people really need. And the exam and it's in a lot of it's I've I've it's mistakes I've made in my own career or learned from others. And I'll, you know, a, a specific example is people make the greatest financial mistakes or can with houses and cars. There's others, but just use those two for a minute. And it's partially because mental accounting sets in. And if you're building a house or buying more of a house, it's just easy to get out over your skis, right? Because it's, well, I want this. And you can afford a $30,000 car, but you get the $50,000 car because you like leather seats and the moon roof and the stereo system and et cetera, et cetera. All the upgrades, right? Um, and early in my career, uh, I got this phone call and they needed $60,000 out of the $100,000 of an account that they had. And they were at the dealer and they need it now. And then they were upset that, you know, you have to wait two or three days to even get the money. And we had just made the investment about 18 months earlier. So wait a second, this was supposed to be long term. But yeah, I decided to get a car and now they're taking it out of their portfolio and the market was down. So it's like, wait a minute, like I got paid to sell you this 18 months ago because it was supposed to be long term. But now you're cutting the portfolio or the position like over in half and it's down. Like I added no value. It just felt like a disastrous. Mm -hmm. And and I learned in that conversation with that person at that time. And I've learned and I ask it ever since is, you know, Alex, you buy cars usually one of three ways. You drive it till it's dead, you drive it for a certain number of years, or you drive it for a certain number of miles. 
And so part of the financial planning isn't just like how long you're going to be in retirement or how far away it is. It's like what a client really needs to know is when are you buying the next car and where is that money coming from? As one little snapshot of a of of how financial planning needs to be better at where the rubber meets the road, not just projecting the rest of forever, which that's a tool. But if you're not bringing that back into the practical, what does the next six to 12 months look like? Which, by the way, is still a bit of a guess, 12 months. But like people know, clear, are you going to buy a car in the next six months? Like you can answer that for the most, unless you're impulsive. Well, if you're impulsive, you don't have any money. But most of the time. Uh and that's where, again, I think too many people are missing the fact that they're just reacting. Too many advisors are just reacting to whatever the clients call them to basically say, this is what I want. Oh, you want it? Okay, here it is. Instead of thinking in terms of, wait a minute, what shouldn't be invested? One of the core tenets of the total relationship is about making sure you have the right amount of cash allocated for what the client needs in the next 6 to 12 to 24 months. And don't subject that to risk because you can't afford to. Sure. Yeah, it's uh, and I find it interesting that you bring up the point of, you know, the historical uh, financial advisor model, you know, kind of saying, hey, look at this, you know, all the performance of these things, because doesn't FINRA, correct me if I'm wrong, require you to disclose that past performance doesn't dictate future gains like on your <laughs> on like your yeah. marketing materials. So I always kind of find that interesting. I mean, it's good to look at past performance. And I mean, in anything that you deal with, I mean, we deal a lot in you know, exclusively private assets at Advanta. So anytime that I get to read a PPM or something for some type of private placement, you know, they're always looking at past stuff and they always have to disclose that. And, you know, I don't get into the publicly traded world, but I always find it interesting that it's always, it's so much based on the historical instead of, you know, kind of the future, you know, you're going into the future. You need to understand the past. You know, I want to repeat the past. Well, unless you hit it out of the parking lot, try to repeat that. But, you know, maybe, uh, you know, focusing a little bit more forward, which I think is kind of interesting from your perspective is that, um, you know, focusing more on the client need and their future goals is really kind of, you know, the focus of and painting with a very broad brush, kind of the trajectory you prefer to take rather than looking back and saying, hey, look what I have done and can do instead of saying, hey, look at what we can do going forward. Yep. And then it's also being helped. It, it's then having the conversation once we have what we call the total relationship life kind of planned out. Okay, how many more years you want to work and what, what do you want to do in retirement and and what kind of standard of living is that and what's the vacation budget and what's the home improvements we need to plan for? When's the roof kind of going to be replaced? Like things people don't think about. You're like, how's the house? House is, uh, you know, you live there till you're retired. Yes. Okay, great. Well, replace the roof is depending on the size of the house, 10, 20, 30,000 dollars. Replace windows, it's 10 grand. Replace carpet, it's 10 grand. Paint the whole, you know, depending on the size of the house. It, there's there's chunks of capital there. And part of it is just trying to help get people practical around, hey, what do you need the next 12 months? And are you saving for it? Or is it coming from somewhere? And if it's coming from somewhere, can we be looking out ahead of time to decide where it comes from? Because the best time to to take some profits off of an investment is when you have them, not the day you need the money, because now you're at the mercy. You know, it's like you can't, I, I, we say in the book, you can't time the market, you can't time the future rate of any investment, but you can time your needs and when you take money out and to be thinking about doing it ahead of the need, which also for a lot of people gives them permission. Well, I don't want to spend that, that money on that car. Most of the clients we have that have a lot of money saved, which means they didn't spend. Which ironically, the psychology of that means once they get into retirement, which is why they saved all this money, they're afraid to spend it. And what we found is by asking forward looking questions, we can find out what those capital needs are, then get permission from them to go capture those as we see fit where they best can come from. And it's amazing once they see that this piece of profit, this 30 grand was set now into their cash in their bank account, they actually then can go feel like they can spend it versus waiting for them to call to ask. Sometimes they don't. Sure. So basically, you know, the, the general strategy of what I'm getting is that taking a look at, you know, what clients want to spend money on, because what I would assume is kind of the more traditional model is, you know, asking someone saying, hey, you know, what's your risk tolerance? How much money do you feel like you need in retirement? And it's kind of a, you know, people are going to pick an arbitrary number, but imposed to just saying, hey, I'd like to have a million bucks in retirement. Well, that's all well and good, but what do you need that for? Okay, well, you know, I'd like to sell my house in Michigan and move to Florida. All right, let's look at what, you know, 
prices are doing. Let's look at, you know, if you want to buy a new car, what we need for that. And kind of, again, are you, are you saying that you kind of work backwards from, you know, the needs and the wants of the client of what they would like to do and then kind of arrive at a plan and number, or is there some more nuance to that? Yeah, it's, it's kind of different for the stage of which the, where the people are at. So if I kind of broke it down into the accumulators, right, they're, they're wanting to save for retirement. A lot of times people decide or, you know, wake up one day and decide, I need to get serious about saving for my future. And they come and show up and they want to give you not all their money, but they want to give you all this money. And for those people, you actually need to take the time to figure out why shouldn't we do this? And work through when's the next car, work through what kind of debts they have, work through why I shouldn't set this aside in a long-term investment because you're not, you're thinking, because the other part is we can't do it all. We're told we can, but the mistakes most accumulators make is they think I got to get responsible. I got to get in on this. I'm missing out. I need to catch up for, for, for my poor stewardship up to some point. And they want to get real responsible and take everything they have and stick it in some long-term investment and feel good about that. The problem is, is that they didn't, if they didn't account for what they needed 18 months from now from that savings or wherever that money came from, they they put themselves at a behavior. They have a behavioral uh, experience that could derail their future because if you call up and now need the money and in that 18 months the money didn't make money and you lost money and took it out, you may never make investments again. And too many advisors are like, yeah, great. We'll sit in here and get paid or set it aside because that's what you want, right? I'm appeasing what you want. And a lot of times on, on for financial planning for accumulators, it starts with what do we need in the checking account and what do we need in the savings account so that we can buy ourselves two or three years before we ever need to touch any of this. Um especially if you're putting it in some type of IRA or Roth IRA or some type of you know tax deferral or a private placement or whatever these are, it's got to make sure that this is money you cannot touch again, right? Yep. Uh, we ask questions, silly questions, but it's like, uh, <laughs> I've, I've done more, I've, uh, for probably one in five people we meet with, we actually start working with because the other four, we find reasons why they shouldn't give us any of the money on the accumulator side when they're starting out, especially the younger they are. Because it's like, you know, here, I want to give you this twenty, thirty, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars to get started with until I find out they're at, they have a, a fifty thousand dollar home equity loan that they had it was three percent when they took it out three years ago, and now it's like nine, right? It's like people don't pay attention to the fact that wait, there's probably better uses. There's good debt and bad debt. There's foundational work that needs to be done before you get started, um, but not paid to say that, right? So it's like there's so many principles that people need to take and do first before they they start paying someone for advice, but the advisor in public isn't paid to tell them what they shouldn't do, right? That you you, you got to pay off these debts first or pay off the credit. Like too many people are just saying, and, and industries are set up to say, open up the account yourself, throw it in the market, get invested, see what to do without any consideration or without trying to protect the client from themselves to really kind of check, wait a second, are we going to regret this in six to 12 to 24 months? If we if we don't take into consideration a total picture of what your situation looks like, yeah. So, so let's makes, go ahead. Yeah, no. So, but I think that's an interesting point. So, you know, figuring out you know what you need to accomplish first. That's kind of again separated from you know hiring a financial professional. Obviously, you know the needs for someone are going to vary greatly. And I discussed this with um, another guest of mine, Melissa Leone, who was was a fantastic guest. But the you know, she used the analogy of, you know, pulling a car out of a driveway. It's like the first thing you need to do when you start your financial journey is get in that car, look around, figure out exactly what you have going around on going on around you, then back out of that driveway, pull down the road, stop sign, look at where you've accomplished. And then, you know, by the time that you're driving through the city or getting on the interstate and you've accomplished those things, you're driving the car down the road, then look at hiring a financial professional. But if you can't even, you know, figure out what's going on outside your house, hiring a financial professional is not going to help that. So let's kind of maybe break that down a little bit under a few aspects um, you mentioned of what the, you know, more introspective thing that people need to do. You know, if you want to become an accumulator, well, you have to be, you know, in a position that that makes sense. You know, you can't say, take all my money, stick it in here when you have things like credit card debts, big outstanding private student loans, um, you know, maybe a HELOC or something else that's just like eating up all this capital that you well and do need money for, but you also have to be realistic that you don't want to, again, like to the example of dumping all this money in and then 
not realizing that you have all this other stuff going on, having to pull stuff out, maybe taking losses. So what are some of the kind of the big things out there that people need to kind of, again, take pause, look at first before maybe they jump into the realm of, you know, having a professional money manager or financial advisor? What are those good baseline metrics? Yeah, I, I think I, I usually when someone's asked me, like, where do I get started? Right. So I, I, I and and maybe they don't even have a whole lot saved or anything saved. Where do I get started? <clears throat> And what I tell them is, is that it's to have an understanding of what are your debts that have a fixed rate and a set period of payments, often car loans, uh, mortgages, student loans, for, for the most part, they have a fixed rate of interest and they have a fixed payment for a fixed period of terms and just know what those are. But what you also want to really know is what are your variable rates? Those are your credit card debts often. Home equity lines can be a variable rate. And uh, it's just knowing what those are, because when those are really, really low, they feel good. But then you go unconscious. And I think credit cards in the last uh, from credit cards from 2022 into 2023 went from somewhere in the 15 to 20 percent interest range to now they're somewhere in the 25 to 30 percent interest rate range. They uh -huh. and without anybody paying any attention, like that's an enormous difference of compounding interest against you. It's like having financial cancer, if you will. So it's knowing what those are. And then the best way to get started to try and save for your future, which is on you to do, uh, Social Security, which is often only income source for most people that are going to be retiring into the future, is a, is a poverty wage, right? It is a, it's a social wage of a standard of living that keeps you right about at the poverty rate. So if you're going to have any kind of lifestyle of retirement, it's up to you. And to where you get started, for most people, they often work for a company that has some type of retirement plan. Most of those retirement plans have some type of matching. And what that simply means is that matching is if you put a dollar in this plan, the employer will put a dollar on top of that up to a certain amount. And the way I try and tell people to get started is, is not, uh, the way you get started is, is the, your next pay raise take half of it and put it in that retirement plan and keep doing that until you max out how much you can put in there because there's match. And and the goal at first and foremost is to try and get every dollar of that match you can get. That is secondary to paying down your variable interest rates that are over 10% or double digits. And the reason for that is that that just compounds against you for the most part, uh, to, say, to say the least. But after that, the other thing that a lot of those uh, retirement plans allow you to do is you're putting money aside before you pay taxes on that money, which is an which really, if you're trying to save $100, for example, uh, it's like you're saving 120 because that 20% tax you're not you're not losing that to get your hundred because yeah. uh, coming out on a pre-tax basis for most people. And so that's a, that's the best way we've encouraged people to try and get started. But just it's to kind of you know it's i think to some extent it really is more powerful to go back to the old here's a piece of paper and here's a pencil write these things down here's your couple debts right mortgage student loan automobile credit card right variable uh, a home equity line if you have one variable and write those three or four things down on a piece of paper and then once a month just kind of write the balances down or once a quarter or once a year so you can see how they're ratcheting down, but then on, draw a line over there and then watch when you start putting money in that retirement account. Because if you, over the course of a year, you put you 100 bucks a month, you put $1,200 in there, if that gets matched, all of a sudden that's $2,400. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, Go ahead. And it, no, it just, it, 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 the, the act, and we don't get that, for whatever reason, the psychology or the feeling of seeing that progress is lost when we're trying to do it on technology. Technology is great. Yeah, but, but there's something about writing it down, right, and seeing uh -huh. it and reflecting back on that. And and there's books been written on that. There's some uh, Dave Ramsey's an author, uh, Susie Orman's an author that basically you know preach just the 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 writing this stuff down and kind of tracking a little bit goes a long way to getting started. Yeah, and I think a kind of a core focus is again with you. Correct me if I'm wrong, but is a lot of the psychology of the person that you're advising. Correct is kind of a core tenet of it. Yep. Yeah. So. Before we kind of dive into that, one interesting thing that I like to bring up, um, for whatever reason, I tend to be the, the glutton for punishment with new legislation um, and getting to read those big stacks of awesome uh, legislative yeah, documents. Um, but one thing in mentioning, um, you know, participating in retirement plans and especially looking at variable or higher interest rate debts that people have, and student loans is a big one. Uh, but you mentioned the employer match for 
um, 401ks. Uh, are you aware or have you seen the, um, the, the portion of the legislation that offers the participation uh, qualification for paying student loans and getting the employer matched to 401k plans that was written in? They haven't given guidance on it yet, but I think it's kind of a cool little adjunct. Are you aware of that one? Yeah, so the gist of how that, again, the gist of how that works is where you, for the money that you would have had the opportunity to put into a 401k to the extent that you can show in a statement that you put that in against your student loans, that mm -hmm. counts as your contribution. The employer then, uh, if there's matching dollars, it doesn't, and this gets confusing for some, they misread it. It doesn't, yeah. the, the, the employer match doesn't go against paying down your student loan. The employer match still goes in that retirement account that you get to yep. have with the employer. Uh, but it, it, but it's a way, and you can do both, right? So it's not, it, you can, if you made these minimum payments or whatever your payments is on your student loans, and in addition to that, you made this 401k right. contribution, but that you didn't qualify for the full match. Well, if you add your student loan payments, you might. And so that, that is, um, yeah, they, uh, the secure act one and secure act two, uh, one was simple. One was a lot of changes, but, but two was like a hundred and one. It's like, yeah. holy buckets. Uh, yeah, it was, a, a it was pretty cool. And, and, you know, I rarely do I ever give our legislators um, a lot of kudos, but, um, you know, they definitely did some good stuff. You know, they I don't really know how well implemented things like a Roth SEP IRA and a Roth Simple IRA are going to be in functionality. We'll see. They haven't even given us guidance on how to report those um, to them yet. So we don't even have reporting codes. Um, but, you know, anecdotally, personally from that, you know, when I first started my career, you know, my wife and I made the decision that we were going to pay our student loans at the detriment of participating in 401k plans, which I think, you know, in the long run, you know, through our, you know, later half of our 20s was a better decision, you know, make sure we get rid of that, you know, it's harder to make 9% you know, it's harder to make 18% to make nine on that money as opposed to this, just pay that off and then just try to shoot for 9%. You know, it's that, that adage of, you know, it's like, you know, just because you're paying, you know, you don't have to make 9% to make up for that. You have to make 18 to make nine. And people don't kind of realize that, which is odd, but you know, I think that again, that's a really good aspect. And anytime we get into this area, I like to make sure people realize there's some good stuff that just came out. Um, but not to get too far sidetracked into that. I just, you know, again, yeah, I'll, no. give, I'll give, I'll give credit where credits due occasionally. Um, yeah, I think there's a psychology though that is, I, I almost, you can change it. I don't see it changed as much as I see people kind of either grew up with it or it evolved, and it has to do with what we call funded contentment. It has to do with what, what brings them happiness. And so, if your happiness is the new car or the bigger house, it's like financially you might struggle your whole life. I've been dumbfounded that I have had. Uh, I can think of a uh, of a couple that has if they have five kids they have seven now, <laughs> but by the time they were thirty they had had their little house paid off they had had uh, well over six figures saved uh, not just in retirement accounts but the ability to come and come and try and start building wealth, and realizing that I think the one, the one was the stay at home uh, overseeing the kids and the other one was maybe making fifty or sixty thousand dollars it wasn't like a lot like it was just like this huge salary. And I started asking silly questions. I'm like, what did you do? And it's just like, well, you know, we, we clip coupons and we, uh, the one that threw me was at night, we'll never have the house. We set the house at 60. We just have a lot of blankets. It's just like, we are in the Northern, you know, I'm in the Northern Midwest. It's like, you, you get a couple months where it's pretty chilly and it's like, okay. And they don't have air conditioning. So, okay, I guess it gets a little warm on the other side, but it's just like, Okay, but those little sacrifices added up, and they were content as clams about it. And yet, you have other people. It's like I can't get my house cold enough, right? And I'm paying through the nose to have it, and um, and the bigger, better, more. If I can graduate to the other extreme for a minute, though, so that's the psychology of those that are starting out in the accumulating phase. You, you know, you have all these baby boomers. I think it's ten thousand a day are turning sixty five till twenty thirty. Yep. So there's still you have all these folks that have saved for retirement. And what the total relationship helps do for them is to try and teach the financial advisors to help the client realize uh, if you have enough to retire, there's some, there's a psychology that I just got to keep working. I need, I need to save for, I need to save more, I need to save more. And realizing that some people end up retired or working longer than they needed to, that they could retired years ago. And then, you know, from a health standpoint, you may not have these, you know, what, where do you, where do you want to spend your time at the office working for somebody else or at home or with your family or exploring other opportunities? 
And ironically, for some, it's a personal choice, right? It's a per, it, it's how you're wired. But when we can sit down with somebody and help them realize they can be done, I've had clients that wanted to quit their job, come to see me, go to retire. They realize they don't think they can. I real I show them they can, and then they stay working. And they stay working because all of a sudden they realize what bothered them at work bothered them because they had to work because they had to keep saving for retirement. And once they realized I can retire whenever I want. Now they like work and the, the things that bother them, it's like, well, I could just quit, but I, eh, I'll just come back tomorrow and see if I still don't like it. Right. And so all of a sudden it became this freedom of a quality of life of, again, going back to what is contentment and is, is it retirement or is it not having to work with the pressure of I have to do it, but I choose to do it, which is a different mindset. Right. Um, that's the part of the planning process is under not having anything to do with the money it has everything to do with what do they want out of their life? And what does that cost? And and then understand you can't do it all. So is it is it is it spending more on travel or having a bigger home or is it downsizing the home or 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 how do we fix the automobile purchases and spread those out? How do we make this cash flow last? How do we take advantage if you have all this money in a retirement account and nothing outside of these retirement accounts and and the your your loopholes and the tax planning that came out with the Secure Act that we just talked about? There's so much um to explore that has nothing to do with what we actually end up investing the money in. Sure. So let's kind of explore that to a point. So, you know, obviously there's probably like a general, uh, you know, intro that you have with people, you know, talking about, you know, trying to figure out their psychology, their wants and needs, and it's obviously going to change for everyone, but as a general benchmark or just, you know, a, a normal, you know, course of conversation, like let's explore kind of how that typically goes, you know, where would you say that people kind of overestimate wants and needs and typically places where people are, are under selling themselves and kind of what they want and need and kind of where's the, you know, slope intersect of those two, um, you know, goals, if they will. Yeah. So when we get started with someone, we'll sit down and it's, you know, the total relationship kind of has three phases to it, to, to working with a, uh, a client or, or an advisor advising clients. The first part of it starts with, again, this life plan, the total relationship around how you relate going back to it's a client's understanding a client's relationship to family members. Start there. You know, we ask how your parents are doing because parents are one of three categories. You're either going to receive an inheritance from them. They're going to break even uh, or you're going to need to financially help them. It's often one of the three and to call a client to talk to them about anything with regards to their own lives to find out that mom or dad just fell or have just got diagnosed with something like these things really affect people and just trying to stay in touch with. And if if unfortunately one of the parents have passed away, we'll ask how old they were when that happened to, to decide to understand the psychology behind. Well, if your dad passed away when you were, you know, when he was 50 and you were 27, you know, and now you're 50 or 55, that may affect how long you think you're going to live. Those are all important parts of understanding the psychology and the behavior of how people are going to make these financial decisions. So that's part of the conversation, family members, and then also kids. Do you want kids? How many do you have? Are you done having them? Do you, are your kids having kids? Those That, that family tree vertically is uh, is probably the most important thing from a value standpoint of how people are are processing decisions with regards to um, what really matters, right? And it's not it has nothing to do with finance. It has nothing to do with love and how we're raised and, and family. Um, beyond that, we get into health, right? The health of the actual client themselves, the individual themselves, because if they have health issues or prevailing health issues or the family has genetic health issues that are going to be out there, again, when we're trying to talk to, if the planning software says, hey, you're going to live to 100, well, Without asking some of these other questions, you may not, you know, just start with, hey, you live to 100. I'd rather flush out that you already have concerns. You don't think you're going to live to 70, right? So those are important points. And instead of saying, hey, it's 100 and you back it down to 70 and then I find out why, I'd rather ask these relational questions on the front end and how the individual relates emotionally to these different facts that are out there. So family, health, we then get into talk about occupation. What's the job? Are you afraid of the job? Do you like the job? What's the job you do if you could do any job you wanted to do? Retirement is the last job people have, as we like to say. We talk about your recreations because that's often what you spend money on with regards to hobbies and things that you like to do. Those evolve and then fall off, right? They have a life of three to five to 10 years at the most before all of a sudden you're on to doing something else. Uh, occupation, recreation, 
uh, mission is what you're called, you know, these, this is where you're going to find out about what kind of volunteering they want to do, what kind of impact they want to have in the world beyond just their family and their friends, uh, what legacy they want to leave. And so that's kind of the, what we'd like to say, that's kind of the form their life is taking. Beyond that, we get into granular things. It's like, let's talk about your house. Do you think you're going to stay in the house for the next five, 10 years? You're going to retire in your house. You're going to die in your house. Tell me about your house. Do you want to upgrade, downgrade? Do you want to add on additions? Are you looking to remodel? What needs to be done? What are the home improvements? Because these are all finding out time frames of when capital may be needed. Then we get into travel because, you know, especially coming out of COVID, it was like, nope, I'm, I don't care. I'm going, right? And what's kind of the annual travel budget? How many trips do you kind of do a year in the United States? Is it, is, are you flying or driving or is it next door or you don't travel at all? Some people are extremely content just staying in their homes. It's like just trying to understand what that looks like. Or, nope, it's international or I don't like – when I get done working, I'm going to travel the world. Uh, and it's just understanding what these dreams and hopes and goals are. Getting after that, so again, health, uh, homes, travel, automobiles. Literally, like we track clients' mileage going back to if you drive a car and every 100,000 miles you turn it over, I want to know how close we are to that 100,000 mark, right? Um, and especially when clients get into retirement, if the husband and wife every year were buying the car, when they bought cars, they bought two of them on the same year. A planning thing is to stretch those purchases out a little bit. So it's like every other year, every other or every three years or every five years, we're buying a car and, and spreading out that financial hit to the accounts. Uh, that Those are kind of the big broad brushes. Then obviously you get into the tax, the insurance, the estate planning, um, but trying to help an individual understand what how they feel about family, how they feel about health events, how they feel about living in their home buying cars, those types of things all bring a plan. And then the second meeting, that's the first meeting. The second meeting, if we're working with somebody, gets around the wealth and how how do they feel about markets or risk, their bank accounts, what are they saved, what's their income power, what's the what's the uh, what was the goal over here for retirement? And we're trying to understand then the relationship of the wealth to how those come together. So just before we get too far into the second bucket, I just had kind of an just from your perspective, what do you think out of that first for the life plan is the one that gets um, that you, you find that you rein clients in a little bit more on and one that you give that people like, you know, you can probably do more of this. Um, you know, what would you say is, is kind of the one where you're like, all right, let's really look at this. And here's how maybe of a uh, different direction you might want to go with it. Would it be I, I would assume probably cars when I would pick. Yeah, actually. Ironically, the one I rein people more in on is uh, family helping family when you're not really helping. Yeah. Um, a lot of times you're enabling or because you feel bad as a parent that some of some of the choices of your child haven't worked out quite well and you keep sending or financial support. And uh, I have a saying that I'm, I am thrilled to help a parent help a child when we're helping them come out of the pit. I'm often trying to help people realize you're just giving them a bigger shovel to keep digging this pit that they're in. Um, and so that's a hard, that's a hard one or, or siblings or, or parents or whatever. It's like, you're making a sacrifice to help somebody now at the cost of your future later that you can't fix later. So that's a hard one. Um, the ironically for most of our clients that are retired, we spend more of our time not reining them in. It's encouraging them to do it. Yep. And on the accumulator side, it's a mixed bag because it depends where it's it's as they're figuring things out or as they have different inheritances. But for the most part, it's to try and get them away from um, the instant gratification and realize the financial benefit of delayed gratification of spending the money because we saved it up and now we have it than financing it. Yeah, you know, for for the most part, if you can if you can avoid the financing costs of everything you purchase. Uh, probably outside of the home, uh, or at the and especially the home improvements, the better your whole financial situation will be. Yeah, I really feel like it gives you a lot. And again, I'm not allergic to debt by any means. I you know debt definitely has a place in in, in life in general. You know if it if it has no place in your life, then kudos to you. But um, you know I feel like it gives people a lot more agency over their own destiny and just and, and you know like your your personal agency as well of you know like total ownership of you know yourself your actions your accumulated items and assets 
um, you know, if you can own things, you know, again, you know, I, I'm a car guy, but, uh, I, I'm allergic to car payments. So, uh, you know, I have a Jeep in a million pieces, uh, you know, wheel and deal. And my car actually will click over 200,000 miles when I go to Orlando this weekend. Um, I love that thing. I'm never getting rid of it. And so I definitely am the person that falls into that bucket. Um, but again, that's just kind of my personal anecdote to it is that, you know, there, there's something to be said and, you know, obviously, like you said, you know, spend money if you've accumulated it, you know, you don't, you don't get to take it with you at the end of the day. Um, you know, you need to look at that bucket of, you know, what kind of legacy do you want to have to people, but, um, you know, enjoy the things that you've worked hard for. But the, um, you know, the, the ownership and agency is something at least personally from my financial goal and plan that I really feel is, uh, important, um, you know, one day I'll have the house paid off, but, you know, we don't have consumer debt on anything. You know, we own all the fun toys and everything. So, again, I kind of yeah. agree and, to that point. And the really hard point. part with the house, uh, well, the other thing we've tried to help people realize is stop thinking that your home is an investment. It's a home. And mm-hmm. the hard part is, is that for some, that the more you try and make the home an investment, which which would come usually with trying to make upgrades or get a bigger home or a better home or whatever that looks like, is it becomes a financial trap. Yep. Because you get trapped into the payments, you get trapped into the higher costs, the higher taxes, the higher maintenance and upkeep. And um, yeah, home is a place to have memories and have contentment and have safety. Uh, and the longer you can stay in one place, the better, because the realtor hits and the taxes of uh, of uh, the tax to moving and and we got to get rid of everything. And then the stress of all that, it's uh, staying put is a great financial place to be. Uh, for most people, once they get settled into their decision around kids. Sure. Okay, great. Now, let's uh, since we're kind of coming up a little bit towards the end of it, I want to kind of make sure we – so we covered the life plan portion of it. You mentioned there's three basic buckets, right, to kind of yep. how you approach this. So yep. what would be the second one that we can transition into? Yeah, so the, so the total relationship is wealth, and so that's going back to your feelings about your wealth, your opportunities to build wealth, the wealth you may be receiving from parents – how you're going to steward your wealth, and then what aspect of that wealth needs to grow to keep up with the cost of living and your purchasing power, and realize that as everybody is experiencing some inflation in 20, everybody experienced inflation here in 2023, you have to actually set yourself up to beat inflation before the inflation shows up. Like you can't fix your 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 portfolio to beat inflation once inflation's here. That's too late. Um, and so that's kind of the aspect around wealth and then the monitoring, the balance of where does that wealth need to come in and fund that life becomes that third piece. And this is where the role of a financial advisor needs to be. And that's what we call the total relationship care, where we're caring enough to pay attention to how is your health and how is the parents and how are, how's that life being lived? Are we helping, like, instead of trying to make your portfolio bigger or make some performance report that I'm beating some index compared to something in the past, it's like our purpose is can I make your life better based on what you told me you wanted in your life? Because the truth of the matter is, I don't care who you are, you can't have it all. I mean, the world's trying to tell us with a trillion dollar marketing plan that we can and we should try and let's go into debt to do so. And the reality is, is no, you can't have it all, but you can have a lot of what you wanted. And how do we help you get there? And how do we help you realize that no, that money needs to come out of that investment that you really love and now be set aside to buy that improvement or take that vacation or allow you not to retire and take that income stream that you can come from these assets that we set aside and, and caring to monitor both of those things and talk about, again, where's that mileage on the car? Good for you. We become an advocate. How's the Jeep? Can we get to 300, right? Let's, let's do that. And it's, and it's not how Apple's doing or how the S and P 500 is doing or what's going on in the market. And let me show you performance reports or your large cap or your mid cap or your small cap or somehow my value add is I'm going to beat a world market that everyone's going to come out in the averaging over the course of people's lifetimes. That the real value of an advisor is how you can care for those two different buckets. If you start asking questions and be focusing a little bit differently than you were taught or than the tools that these industries give us to use. Yeah, no, I really, and again, this is, I always like to kind of, you know, get a different perspective or try to learn something from any one of my clients, you know, or any one of my um, podcast guests. And, you know, sometimes I, you know, not that I know everything, but, you know, I can kind of say, yeah, you know, I generally understand everything and I've had a lot of experience, but I've never really kind of thought about the psychology to this extent. It may be this granular. It's, It's interesting to kind of take a look at it from the perspective of, okay, you know, and for better or worse, you know, mainly my financial kind of generalized plan is, you know, try to keep any type of variable debt 
as low or as like removed as possible, fixed rate debt as low of an interest rate possible, stretch out over as long of a period as possible, and then just kind of, you know, shooting for, you know, as many commas and zeros as I can in my financial portfolios. But really past that, I really don't really kind of think about the, um, you know, the psychology behind it. And it's, it's definitely interesting to think because that all drives the decisions I've made. But I think I could, you know, certainly if I took a look at it, be a little bit more uh, effective in my plan if I looked at these things. And, and what I like about it is it's not necessarily, you know, it's not, you know, reinventing the wheel. It's not something that's inherently complicated. It's a lot of questions that are easy to answer, but, you know, the, you know, the, the implementation can be a little bit tricky. But, you know, working back from that, I think is really kind of a, uh, an interesting and I would assume probably pretty effective tool for your clients, correct? Well, so in behavioral finance, they basically have proven that psychologically people take this portfolio and that, you know, I'll use an example. Let's say you have a $500,000 portfolio and the market drops, uh, you know, 50 grand or 20% drops a hundred thousand dollars. Did it a couple of times over the last couple of years. And the psychology of someone seeing that goes, well, that was my car. I was just going to buy. And behavioral finance shows that because they equated the loss to something tangible to make themselves feel better, they call the advisor, they take out a hundred grand and go buy the car. Now your portfolio is at 300 grand. And th those are the mistakes. And then what I was realizing in my career is like, wait, if I can identify you need a car, let's have that carved off. So now if your portfolio fluctuates, it's just fluctuating. It's not attached to something tangible that to make yourself feel better, you're going to go buy it. Because if you want to buy it, it's sitting there. We set yep. it aside. We helped care enough to think in advance of what the future is. Instead of looking backwards, most advisors are being taught to teach a client or look at a client and say, the last year, two years, five years, 10 years, we did this and that's my value. Their value needs to be what you can control as to what they need into the future and how it shouldn't be invested or should come out of an investment to make sure they don't make that emotional mistake. And the value add you can make there, which you actually have a lot more control over, is why we wrote this book to try and give these advisors a different conversation or let clients think a little differently about the past and more importantly, the future. Yeah, and I would say that that kind of also drives to kind of bring it into kind of a, a package deal is that, you know, someone who doesn't have a lot of these drains or needs or external desires, that's someone that's like, okay, well, we don't need to be super aggressive with something. You can be someone that takes a pathway that basically just tries to, you know, beat inflation by a few points and be extremely conservative versus someone who needs to be more aggressive and then also understanding with that plan comes inherent risk, which comes, you know, at the expense of saying, okay, well, you know, if you had, if you're big on tangible and you're a very materialistic person, which it's not a bad thing inherently, but, you know, need to understand what you actually are and aren't, you know, that's going to carry more risk and, you know, be, you know, something that you need to really take a close eye on from the advisor's perspective and personally as well. Uh, you know, I really think that's, again, very interesting of not just saying, hey, you know, we did X on past performance, which again, to go back to the beginning, I find it very funny that that's kind of the mantra when it's required that they disclose that past performance doesn't dictate future returns. Um, but, you know, saying, hey, OK, great, you know, you you, you want to retire, you want a million bucks. Well, here's what we've done over here. Here's how much you need to put in X, Y, Z on the computer and kind of ship it. Um, you know, I do. Again, I, I like the, you know, again, more distilled down granular look at the psychology of this. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, the greatest joy we have is when we help a client, usually in later stages of life, realize they have made it. They have enough. They have all that they need to live the rest of their lives and to help them realize, okay, let's draw a line in the sand. And then the next year, whatever we grow above, whatever that dollar amount was, that's money that you can choose to start giving while you're living to whoever that is, whether it's a charity or a loved one, uh, or just realize you have that freedom to carve that out and set that aside and let them find out what does that look like. That. Um, brings a whole different perspective of joy to a client's life. And the funny thing is, as I tell them, I'm like, I'm not paid to tell you that. Actually, I, I make less by telling you that because you're taking the money out of a portfolio that we've helped grow to go give it to somebody you love. But that's what the purpose of, the, of why we get out of bed in the morning is to try and make people's lives better and help them realize within the context of the relationship that they have with us and that they have with the life that they want to have and the wealth that they want to have and allowing someone to care for them in this way is uh, something that we want to kind of help other people think about, try and implement, and make a difference doing so. No, oh, I think that's a, a very good place to uh, bring this in for a landing. So if people are interested more in you know reading up on what you have, I know I understand you, you wrote a book to this effect as well, or interested in you know engaging you for some professional services, how can they reach you? Yeah, so the best way is through LinkedIn. 
Um, for financial advisors, we created a little group called Total Relationship Advisors where we're going to put some content that's kind of advisor focused. Uh, but for individual uh, investors that want to talk a little bit more, LinkedIn's a good place to go. Uh, the book is coming out at the end of October on Amazon called The Total Relationship. And so that's another place that people can go and just kind of read up themselves on it. But other than that, uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to connect. All right. Fantastic. Well, Tyson, I know the uh, most valuable asset we all have is our time because we can't make any more of it. So I appreciate you taking some of it today to be with us. This is the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. My name is Alex Perny and always have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Alternative Investing Advantage podcast. Tune in next week for more investing tips and strategies. Want to hear more episodes of the Alternative Investing Advantage? Search podcast at advantaira.com and subscribe.